Yeah, thanks, Phil. So Rowan Brill at New South Wales DPI at Wagga Wagga, research and development agronomist. Mostly from what I've seen, it's really matching that variety and selling date um, and then providing enough nitrogen for that crop. And I think in, say, in Victoria, I think obviously you want to manage, get canola into the system where there's as much water available as possible too. So I think a lot of those legume paddocks from 2016 are really set up quite well, especially the lentil paddocks that probably have a bit more water underneath them. They're set up quite well for canola in 2017. I think we've shown we've got a big difference in the phenology of, of the commercial varieties that are available, that some, um, some really race into flowering quite fast and others certainly hold back. And we see those big differences if we get an early sowing opportunity. So if, if we do get a planting opportunity sort of in that early April period that certain varieties do race ahead if they're planted then. So varieties like Diamond and Stingray, they can race ahead and then they can sort of flower a little bit too early and not set enough yield potential. And, um, and potentially there was presentations from the pathologist guys actually showing they, they get exposed to more disease as well. So it's really about knowing which variety you've got and, and matching that to the sowing date to hit, a, to hit an optimum flowering window for your, for your environment. Um, but I think it, over the top of that then is that um, if you get all that stuff right, that supplying enough nitrogen to canola is, is probably the next thing too. So we've seen canola virtually have an insatiable demand for nitrogen and just yield responses just constantly going up to nitrogen and then maybe plateauing. So so supplying enough nitrogen to the crop is going to be the next key. Um, and that's and we're trying to sort of urge people is not necessarily to say that you've actually got to apply that through urea, but actually planting canola in the system to get it into higher nitrogen paddocks. So thinking about in continuous cropping situations, getting it into uh, following legume paddocks or in the mixed farming situation, which is more popular, sort of southern New South Wales, actually bringing it closer to the to the pasture phase as well, which has been done quite well successfully. Oh, I suppose it depends on the individual situation. Some of the bean paddocks, like they, they'll probably start off pretty well, would have grown plenty of biomass last year and, and maybe some of the effects of, say, diseases in some situations might have limited their yield potential, but in turn will actually provide a bit of extra nitrogen to the crop this year. So that'll be the real winners, I suppose, the bean type paddocks. And then the lentils, I suppose, wouldn't have um, fixed a whole heap of nitrogen compared to beans, but at least they're sort of maintaining the system and they're going to be at a starting level, maybe around that sort of 80 to 100 kilos of hectare of end compared to where we've pulled off five or six tonne of barley. So, and they're probably back down around 50 or 60 kilos of arable end. So just giving that buffer of 40 odd kilos of N, which sort of stops the need for, um, for 100 kilos of urea actually going out in the system. Um, and then a bit more mineralisation coming from that as well. So actually providing in through the season from that mineralisation rather than where we've got low end situations of just whacking and on in big blobs, which creates sort of more chances for losses. So our trial in Victoria went from 0.2 tonne of the hectare in 2015 to, to the top yield of 5.6 tonne of the hectare in, in 2016. But we, yeah, we certainly saw those responses of variety in phenology, but we were quite surprised at how well the early mid type varieties did, did to sort of bread and butter of the varieties. And we probably thought that if we got a really good year, some of the longer season type varieties might trump those varieties, but we did see that they were really, they had really good yield provided they were sown at the right time in 2016. So that gives a bit of confidence that those varieties, you'd, you'd probably expect to go and do a bit better in the drier type years as well. And they'll, they'll sort of give growers that confidence that their early to mid type varieties are, are going to be the, um, the bread and butter of their system really and the longer season varieties. So probably where you can take a, an opportunity with an early sowing window as well. Seeing the differences probably with hybrids sort of come out on top of open pollinated TT varieties. So a lot a good development in, in the hybrids and especially at the higher yield potential we're seeing some of the varieties now sort of separating out from the OPTTs but the open pollinated TT varieties are, is a really sound risk management decision where you just um, the input costs are certainly a lot reduced with um, with the OP system where you can retain your own seed, grade it well to two, two mils, if possible, two millimetres, um, and then reduce that seed cost and actually reduce the amount of risk. So we're probably seeing that in most of the sort of medium rainfall environments, I think hybrids probably come out in front economically like seven or eight years out of 10, but there's those couple of years where the OPTTs will come out in front and those years you, you really don't want to be sort of spending too much money on and, and losing money, I suppose. 
We've still got to be wary of sulphur. We've, there's been a lot of trials done with Grey and Arana in, in Central West and just very little response to sulphur. But I think it's really about knowing your paddock. We've, what if we, we tested one soil there at Condoblin and if we tested from 0 to 60, it was only 40, 48 kilos of sulphur. But we tested that down deep to 180 and we had 1,600 kilos of available sulphur. So it's really characterising your soil and knowing your soil and then knowing sort of understanding your sowing date and how deep the roots are getting to be able to access that sulphur. So it's really, so so 0 to 60 centimetre soil tests are quite good for nitrogen, but they're not quite as good for sulphur. So understanding the soil is key for, the, for sulphur.